YouTube, it's Faye, and for today's video, I'm going to be doing front pads and rotors on this lovely 2008 Toyota Tundra. This is actually a special request video from my dear friend Angie, who is a high school auto shop teacher. Thanks, Angie. Hope you all enjoy. Here goes. Tools that you're gonna need for this job are um, all of these in no particular order. Um, this is a 22 millimeter socket for removing the wheels. We've also got a 10 millimeter ratcheting wrench, a 12 millimeter ratcheting wrench. We have ooh, this super cool torque wrench uh, with a 17 millimeter head on it. This is for torquing the caliper bolts. Ooh, which reminds me, I almost forgot that we also need a super long 17 millimeter wrench. Okay. Oh, but add this to the, it's not too late. Oh, uh, a regular torque wrench for torquing the lug nuts at the end. A teeny, teeny, teeny little inch pound torque wrench with a 10 millimeter socket for torquing the brake bleeders on the calipers. Um, also got this handy dandy little pry bar, although a big flathead screwdriver will work just fine. Um, pocket screwdriver. I have a little punch and its counterpart, the ball peen hammer. And, um, oh, I knew there was one more thing. Some pliers. Oh wait, I guess I also showed using this. <laughs> uh, and um, in one of my little, one of my little torque sticks, the 80 foot pound torque stick. Other things, fluids, just some brake parts lubricant, also some red Loctite, and also some anti-seize, and plenty, plenty, plenty of brake clean. Oh my God, I have to stop this for a second right now because I just realized that tool totally made it into the video, but uh, somehow did not make it onto my, my tool list here. So I, uh, I use this little wire brush, a little piece of sandpaper. This is some well-loved sandpaper, but it's purple. Uh, and then this is just a well-loved 3M scotch Bright sort of pad thing. So um, that that is everything that I, uh, that I used for this, this brake job. All right, let's get to work. Because the first thing that I'm gonna do is scope out the level of the brake fluid. Uh, and actually on Toyotas, you never really want to adjust the level of the brake fluid. I've seen a lot of people like, I just topped off your brake fluid. Don't do that on Toyotas. In an ideal world, the fluid level actually reflects the brake pad level. So your brakes are brand new, your fluid level is completely full, and as you wear the pads down, that fluid level will go down because it makes up for the space in the calipers because the calipers push out. <laughs> as the brake pads wear. So the fluid goes from up here in the fluid area down to the caliper. And the reason why that's important is because on your reservoir is a brake light switch. It actually illuminates the brake light on your dash when the level's low. And why is that important? Well, that's Toyota's way of alerting the driver, hey, you're gonna need brake soon, which I don't know, I think that's really cool. So I'm gonna check the fluid, and then what I'm actually gonna do is I'm going to suck the fluid out of the reservoir and put new fluid in the reservoir. And pretty simple, you just hook it up to shop there, you pull the trigger, and it sucks. Alrighty, and now I've just got some regular dot three brake fluid. If you don't know what brake fluid it calls for, you can always take a look on the top of the cap. There it says dot three fluid. So I know that that's what I want. Here we go, put that right back. So I'm gonna put the dot three fluid without spilling, oh my God, in there. It's stressful. Okay, I'm actually gonna fill it all the way to the top here. Now the reason why I'm doing that is not because I'm performing a full brake fluid flush today. The brake fluid was flushed not that long ago, actually the last time that the brakes were done, both the front and the rear, so the entire brake fluid system. But since I'm gonna be sucking fluid out of the calipers and it needs to be replaced anyway, it's just good habit to put the clean fluid in first just so that you're not sucking a whole bunch of gunk through the system. If I was to be performing a brake fluid flush, I would actually have a, a little bleeder bottle there, upside down bottle that would be constantly refilling the system so that I don't ever suck the system dry, don't allow any air in the system, but that's another topic for another time. All that I'm doing right now is just making sure that the fluid that I'm sucking through is clean. And then I'm gonna put these things back in there. You don't wanna just leave it open because you don't want anything going in there. What I am gonna do though, is now that I've got the screen off, I'm actually gonna clean the screen. So I'm gonna clean this and then uh, come back and, and put it on and then put the cap on and then I'll continue my work, so. And then as soon as I open the bottle, I like just put a date on it for the date that I opened it. This is one of those fluids that as soon as you break the seal on the top, it's like a ticking time bomb. It's only good for so long because it does absorb moisture from the atmosphere. So I put the date so that I know. If it's like six months or nine months old, I'll test it with my brake fluid moisture tester. Um, but once again, I'm gonna cover brake fluid flushing and brake fluid and stuff in another video. This is just this is just about replacing front brakes. So carry on, Faye, carry on. Actually, I'm gonna make this a time lapse.
Now I've got my my 22 millimeter socket to remove these wheels. Most larger Toyota vehicles use a 22 and the smaller ones use a 21. So. You were there. You were there. All right, and wheel. All right, so let's get to work, shall we? Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is grab my magnetic tray and uh, place it right there, ready to accept my parts. And uh, the second thing I'm gonna do is, if this is the first time that I'm doing brakes like this, I'll take a picture of how things look <laughs> so that when I put things back together, it's normal. Now, um, I also recommend that if it's the first time doing brakes like this, you do one side first and then the other side uh, so that you can go back and look and compare and contrast. So uh, yeah, I would, I would take a picture of this setup if I thought that I might forget how these little weird little metal clips go back together. And then I'm gonna grab my pliers. And uh, these are just, just regular little needle nose. I mean, they're kind of excessively long. You can grab any pliers. And I'm gonna go ahead and remove these little metal clips. And now I've got my well-loved ball peen hammer uh, and a little punch. And there are two metal pins right here. And I'm just gonna punch them out this way. And we're gonna get back to these guys these guys later because you obviously don't want to leave them like this so so now that I've got my brake pads loose I'm gonna go ahead and remove them and I'm gonna do so by utilizing my nice little teeny tiny pry bar but a flat head screwdriver that's fairly substantial would work fine as well and uh, my 10 millimeter wrench along with um, a pocket screwdriver and my handy dandy bleeder bottle uh, from Capri Tools. I love this thing. Uh, this actually, I just got um, a little bungee on this and there's a perfect spot where I can hook it up in here. So here we go. And with my pocket screwdriver, I'm just popping the little cap off of the bleeder that's on the top of the caliper. Dust cap, dust cover. Stick that right there so I don't lose it. And then I'm gonna hook up this end to the bleeder like so. And now I've got my 10 millimeter wrench and I'm going to loosen the bleeder. Here we go. And and with this being open, now I'll actually be able to push the fluid out of the calipers and release these brake pads, which are stuck in here right now. So I know I'm gonna be replacing the pads, and I know I'm gonna be replacing the rotor, so I'm not worried about causing any damage here. And what I'm gonna do is use my nice little pry bar, and you don't wanna shove this in because you can cause damage to the caliper pistons, so you wanna be fairly gentle. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pry up against the inside of the caliper and the outside of the brake pad. And you can do this on either side. By me doing it on this side, I'm pushing in the caliper on, on this side, the caliper piston. And you can watch and see the brake fluid come out. So, there. And that loosened up one pad. Set that aside, and then I'll be able to remove the other pad. I love how these have little holes in them so I can just like, if you get them stuck in there, it's so easy to pry out, so. There we go, I'm gonna set those aside. One thing that I wanna take note of right now is look how these pistons are flush with the caliper body. So I'm not doing this brake job because the customer has low brake pads. That was not the cause of this brake job. This brake job needed to be done because the rotors were warped and you have to put new pads and rotors on together. So unfortunately these pads are no longer any good. I gotta put new pads in there. But um, if you are doing this job due to the normal reason people do brakes because your pads are low, then you wanna make sure that Whereas just now, I only push those back a little bit. You wanna make sure that you take this time now to push all of your pistons all the way back in so that they are flush just like mine are right now. And that's the only way that you'll be able to get the new pads in. Also, now is the perfect time to do it because you've got these old pads and you've still got the old rotors on. And since we're gonna be replacing them, it doesn't matter if you scratch them or gull them or mar them or uh, I don't even know if those are words, but, uh, but you know what I mean. So look at that. That's what you want yours to look like when you're done pushing the pads in and retracting those caliper pistons all the way. Look that beautiful. They look beautiful. Okay, let's move on. And then I'm just clearing the hose so it doesn't spill any more fluid. You don't want to spill brake fluid anywhere because it's like it just, it will destroy paint and it will destroy anything. Um, but one place where I'm okay with letting a little brake fluid drip is out of the bleeder right now because I'm watching it and I'm watching it until it drips fluid. So at first when I take the hose off, air bubbles come out. You don't want any air in here. It's supposed to be a sealed hydraulic system, right? So I'm watching it, I'm watching it. 
and I am closing it back up now that it is dripping a steady stream. And then that way I know that there's no air in there. Here, let me show you. There, see that? And, and if it is leaking any air, you'll be able to see because the bubbles will just come out and this is a nice steady stream. So now I'm confident and you're not gonna damage the paint on the caliper because there's no paint on the caliper. Um, so now I'm just gonna be tightening this back up. Perfect. All right, so now that we've got our brake pads out, it's time for me to remove the caliper and remove the rotor. So I'm um, looking on the back side of the caliper. It can be a little confusing because there's like a ton of bolts going on. And in this particular case, it's super cool because you only really need to remove two bolts that in this entire thing just slides right off. So before we do that, however, um, make note that there is a solid metal brake line here. And then this is Bubbly. We don't want to bend, we don't want to kink this. So the first thing I'm going to do is undo this bolt right here and free up this bracket so that when I move around this caliper, I'm using this flexible hose for my motion. I'm not bending this line. Got a little bit of leverage because I don't know who put this on last and if it's going to be problematic. So give myself a little leverage. Okay, and it was fine. So switching over to my ratcheting wrench. Get this job a little faster. Could be using power tools, but I really like hand tools whenever possible because then I can actually feel it. So put this bolt right here in my magnetic tray. Sweet, and that is loose. All right, so after loosening the brake line bracket, I'm also gonna be loosening this wheel speed sensor wire harness connector. Oh, someone, I guess, already broke it. That looks like a little piece of zip tie. <laughs> Where it connects up here, okay. So my little needle nose pliers and just give it a little squeeze and a pull. That's pretty, pretty simple and straightforward. Do you see how it's got those little tabs? It's essentially squeezing on them as I pulled it out. So that's that, and now this is nice and loose. Now, one cool thing about the Tundra is that it's got this big, beefy lower control arm, so I can actually just set this caliper there after I remove it. If I did not have this situation going, I would be using one of these very, 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 very fancy old coat hanger pieces. <laughs> Because you don't ever want to just let the caliper hang by the brake line. Um, typically when brake lines fail, they fail kind of on the inside rather than the outside. Sometimes when inspecting them, we can see that there's like, you know, a bunch of cracks on the surface and stuff like that. So like we can see if a brake line is deteriorating externally, but we can't see if a brake line is collapsing internally. So you just don't want to, uh, you don't want to do anything to damage your brake lines. So if I was going to be letting this hang or if there wasn't a nice place for me to just set this caliper down, I have a got this lovely, lovely little hook, and you can hook that up here around the upper control arm. Um, but of course, once again, be careful of the lines. You could also hook this onto the coil spring and then hook the other portion onto the caliper itself. But uh, like I said, in this particular instance, I'll be, uh, I'll be setting it right there, so this is not necessary. But using this brake tutorial for something other than a, uh, a tundra, uh, grab yourself a metal coat hanger and hook up your caliper. Okay, now it's time to remove the caliper. So I have, once again, leverage and a 17 millimeter, and I'm gonna undo the bolts that are holding the caliper onto the knuckle right here so i've got one there and the other one is down here i'm using my hand tool because i just want to feel what these feel like coming apart i want to make sure the bolts aren't stripped sometimes we like to put these on with impact and that was actually that was actually fine there we go now it's nice and loose one thing that i'm noticing as i'm taking this out is that do you see how there is red loctite on this bolt now if i didn't have an instruction manual in front of me and i saw that hey these brakes have been breaking really well for a long time i'm going to try to sort of emulate what was there before so looking at this bolt seeing that, that it is red on there i know that i'm gonna have to apply some loctite um or at least the, the previous owner did and uh better to do what works than to skip a step you can learn a lot from just paying attention so now I'm gonna move to the upper one, and once again, I'm just nice and no one over torqued these, which is uh, yeah, kind of rare. Usually people over torque everything. Now at this point, now that it's loose, you can absolutely just go in and remove it. But here is my little battery operated impact, and I have a 17 millimeter wobbly. But make sure that you're supporting the caliper, because at this point it's loose. So even as I remove the bolt with my with my power tool, I'm supporting it the entire time. And now gently rotating it and setting it right here. And it's actually once it's there. It's it's not going anywhere, okay, people? It's fine. So, now let's remove the rotor. If you live somewhere like up north where there's a lot of rust and salt and stuff, then sometimes removing these rotors can be a giant pain in the butt. So what I will do is I'll just go through and put all of the lug nuts back on just to protect the threads. And then I'll, uh, I'll smash it with a giant sledgehammer. And I'm not just gonna smash it on the outside, although you can do that too. Remember, we're, we're gonna be replacing these. That's the reason why we're removing them. So if we damage it, it's okay. But I'll actually smack it in between 
where the lug nuts are because where you're gonna be breaking up the rust and the corrosion that's keeping it seized on there is right around the hub portion here. So uh, in this case though, this just came off really, really, really nicely. Lucky me. Okay, a little side note here. If you have a problem with your rotors seizing onto the hub, put a little anti-seize around the outside like that. So um, I'm gonna take this and I'm not just gonna throw this into the scrap pile. Um, I'm gonna take this and compare it to the new one that I have that's gonna be going on here. Making sure that they're exactly the same. Same diameter, same thickness, same bolt pattern, same depth here. You know, do a really thorough visual inspection because we just really suck to put everything back together and realize that uh, the brakes don't work properly or like things don't fit properly and you wonder why. So don't, uh, don't skip out on these little steps and these little comparison stuff, especially when you're first starting out because it can save you a lot of headache in the long run. So, like this. I'm actually gonna keep this cardboard on the ground. I'm gonna take my new rotor and place it onto the hub. Okay, I know what you're thinking. That's not the right way, Faye. Now I know, I'm, uh, I'm about to clean it. So this, these actually come saturated in a uh, special coating to make sure that they don't rust while they're in storage. So I'm gonna use this to uh, keep my floor clean. And I'm gonna clean off these rotors. Now, there are a lot of different ways to clean off rotors. I'm using Bright Clean, deal with it. So I'm going to wash these with the brake clean. And it's interesting, you can actually see the oil drips, like sort of floating on the layer of brake clean and just dripping right off onto my bag. Awesome, perfect. Now I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side. I'm just gonna, with clean gloved hands, take this, flip it over. <laughs> clean off this dirt and residue. While I'm here, I like to Spin and check out the wheel bearing. This truck has about 200,000 miles on it, so just making sure that, ooh, I'm actually hearing a little bit of crunchiness in there. And in doing that, not only are you potentially selling yourself a little bit more work, but you're also doing a courtesy for the customer because if they have a problem with the wheel bearing, chances are they probably wanna know about it. So now that my rotor's cleaned off, I put two of the lug nuts back on, and that is just to make sure that I've got it flush mounted the way that it's going to be. Now I'll spin and make sure that the rotor is not hitting the backing plate. Because sometimes you get a little busy and you're struggling and you're working and you bend the backing plate and uh, and then that'll make a terrible noise when you get back down on the ground. So now that the rotor's back on, time to put the caliper back on, right? Ah, not so fast, we gotta clean it first. You're not gonna take a shower and then put dirty clothes back on, right? So same thing true with this caliper. It is full of brick dust, it's full of old goo. Uh, we're gonna clean it. But you wanna be really careful when you're cleaning the caliper. There are little rubber seals around the caliper piston, so you don't wanna puncture those. If you damage the rubber, that will cause dirt and debris to get in there, ruin the seal, and can actually just seize and ruin the caliper. So it's gonna be really careful. Cleaning is actually a really important part of this job. And I'm also making sure to clean the points where the brake pad touches. I'm gonna to be lubricating those later on, um, and that will actually help the brakes not be loud and squeaky and noisy. So definitely, definitely don't rush through this stuff. Make sure that you do everything right, and uh, yeah, all right, cool, now we're done. And then I'm going back through with brake clean and cleaning it all off. Unless you're wearing a super heavy duty mask, do not use compressed air to blow the dust out of these. I've seen that happen before, so. <laughs> Before I put this caliper back on, I'm gonna lubricate with uh, some brick parts lubricant. Once I get the caliper on here, I have a hard time reaching the piston surface once it's in there without also getting the lubrication on the rotor. <laughs> Imagine that. So I'm gonna lubricate the calipers now and then put them on and lubricate the brake pads before I put those on. So um, the only real thing that I can say people do this wrong is they put too much on. Uh, and it's, it's tempting because you really want these brakes to be quiet. But if you put too much of the stuff on, then just think about it. It's just gonna like collect all that excess brake dust and like road debris and stuff. And then you've got more crap just like building up in there. So you wanna be conservative with this stuff, so. It's purple. Uh, so I actually just put a little bit on my finger um, because my finger is a lot easier to control than this big weird brush thing. So I uh, just put a little bit on my finger. I'm going to apply a very light coat of this. Now I'm gonna put some red Loctite onto my bolt. This is another thing that you don't wanna like just slather all over there. You just need a little bit. And what I like to do is for both bolts, I'll make a line on one bolt and then I'll mush the bolts together. That gives you a nice even distribution and also ensures that it's not too thick and doesn't just goop all over everything, so. And once again, just be really careful not to touch the grease to the rotor. We'll be able to clean it again. There's more opportunities for that, but you just wanna be as perfect as you can. 
to save yourself some hassle later. Threading in these caliper bolts by hand. After I thread them in quite a bit by hand first, then I can go back and use the impact. This is a very, very weak tool, so I'm not gonna over torque it just to get them a little bit tighter. Okay, and now I'm gonna do the final torque by hand, and on these, it's 73 foot-pounds. And also, I just wanna show you this. This is actually a really cool style uh, torque wrench. I don't know if y'all have seen this before, but this has an attachment uh, for a little crow's feet, and this is important because it's actually kinda hard to, uh, and then they don't come out, which is kinda nice. Like, you've gotta push this little ball to release them. It's actually a little bit hard to get a socket in there, especially on the upper one, because of how the hard brake line comes in the middle brake line. So I find this to be really helpful. So now we've got 73 foot pounds on here. So I'll go ahead and torque bolts. And there we go. And there we go. And once again, if, uh, if you're new to stuff like this, sometimes the steps can get a little bit overwhelming. So one thing that I used to like to do, and actually, honestly, I still do this because, you know, I've got a lot going on in my mind and I'm a perfectionist and I like to, you know, be able to sleep at night, is after I've torqued the bolts, I'll just remind myself that I torqued them by giving a little dot of paint to the caliper bolt. Now it's time to install our brake pads and check these out. These have kind of a cool little pattern to them. I usually use OEM stuff for everything. Like I use only Toyota stuff for everything. But in this case, this customer wanted these. So I'm putting these on. What's also cool that this kit came with new hardware. If the old hardware is good, I'll reuse it because I know that it already was working fine. Uh, but if it seems like it's just not up to par, then uh, I'll forgo it and use this, this new stuff. So this is cool. Um, Normally you have to order this separately, but this, in this case, came with the kit. So that's pretty rad. I'm gonna set that down. One thing that Toyotas love is a very specific lubrication technique that makes sure that they don't make any noise. Pull the backing plate off here. And like I said before, any of this grease that's excessive, that's exposed, is just gonna pick up a bunch of dust and debris and crap. That's gonna make your brakes make noise. So there we go. There should be nothing showing around the anti-squeal plate. I don't know what this thing's called. Um, and then the other lubrication point that I have is actually both of the tops. Nice, like very light coat. Then I'll wipe it with my finger and use the excess for the bottom. Do you see what a light coat that is? Like super light coat. Like I'm not doing like a tube of toothpaste or anything like that. So, all right, this is gonna slide right in. So you see what I'm lubricating here is the contact that the pad is making with the caliper. The other place I'm gonna lubricate this is on the opposite side of where the caliper pistons are. So to make sure that I'm not doing this overly excessively, I will test fit the pad and then I'm wiggling it to see where it's gonna be making contact. I pull it back out and look at that. I've got a light little circle there that shows me the outline of where the piston comes out so now I know exactly where to lubricate all right I've, I've talked for a very long time about lubrication now I think you get it I'm gonna slide this in and now I'm just gonna do the other one in the exact same way okay so now that that's done the next step is me putting my pins back in and if you remember from earlier in the video these pins are a freaking mess look at them they are dirty and gritty and rusty and full of a bunch of nasty so um, I'm gonna take a little scotch bright pad and some brake clean and I'm going to clean these up there you go don't those look nice? All right, let's get these back in. And you remember, we punched them out this way, so we're gonna be putting them back in this way. So I always put them in just to make sure that I'm done cleaning and that they slide nicely, and they do. We'll pull it back out here just for a brief second. And then you'll notice that when you put the pin in, of course, that it's a little bit harder to get in when the spring is there. That's why you don't wanna test fit the pin with the spring. So now I'm gonna pop it up, and this guy is there, and this guy is there. Okay, so now we've got one spring in. Now I'm just gonna do the same up above. These little tabs here, as you can probably tell, act to hold the pad into place. It's also holding the pad into place, it's pushing the pads back out. So this is what you want it to look like when you're done. So now there's only one more that we need to do, and that is this guy. You can see that these pins have little holes in them here, and you can put the little tabs in the holes to move these little pins around. Before I hook this in, because then I'm kind of stuck where I'm at, I like to use the two tips as my tools first and make sure that both of the holes of these little caliper slider pins are pointing the direction that I want first. So I've got that one in the direction I want first. I got that one in the direction I want. Okay, cool. So what I'm gonna do first is reach around and grab. See that weird design? And then wire in the hole and whoop, wire in the hole. Cool. So now that we got the pads in, let's reassemble all the other components, shall we? And now this one, I'm not, I'm not torquing the specification. I'm just sort of doing it by feel, good and tight. Now I'm just gonna be replacing the little clips in the wire harness. All right, so we're bolted up here. And I got this guy back in place and I got this guy back in place. This torque specification for this bleeder screw is only seven foot pounds, and I don't have a torque wrench that goes down that low, so I'm using an inch pound torque wrench. I'm gonna multiply seven by 12. I'm gonna do 84 inch pounds. Oh. 
always, always throw these on by hand, every single one. I don't care what you think. And then I'll always do one all the way. And it's the bottom one. So throwing these on by hand, nice and easy. And then I've got my 80 foot pound fork stick. Now, we'll lower the vehicle to the ground. All right, so before I remove the lift arms, I'm gonna torque the wheels. I actually never move the lift arms until the wheels are torqued. Uh, I got my 22 millimeter socket on my torque wrench. Now this is really interesting. Starting in 2008, there were new torque specifications for the Tundra. If they have aluminum wheels, they're 97 foot pounds. If they have steel wheels, it's 154 foot pounds. And if you don't know, get your little pocket screwdriver, magnet, and uh, it magnetizes with steel. So 154, and I've got my torque wrench here. There we go, and you can see that it is on 154 foot pounds. Great, so 154 is actually quite a lot, think about it. Ooh, it's way more than I weigh. Get a fresh set of gloves for my customer car. And oh, can I just show this? I never showed you my final check and top off of the brake fluid, but I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You just make sure it's on the max line, right? Just. Fill it up till it's at the max, okay? Um, and actually the best time to do that is after the initial test drive because your brake fluid will go down a little bit just from the caliper pistons moving out, so. No, no, I, I didn't forget to show you that yet. I just haven't gotten there yet. That's, that's why. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. And uh, if you use my videos in your high school automotive classroom, uh, let me know in the comments below. Or if you just like use them for your own DIY stuff. I always, I always love reading those comments. They make me feel super good and uh, like I'm doing this for a reason, that I have purpose. So um, yeah, anyway, thanks for watching and I will see you in my next video. Okay, bye. You already have a mouthful. I'm sure all moms wish their babies were this interested in lettuce.